Amen to that. I hope you knew that song. Did you know that song? <laughs> Victory in Jesus. I hope you... Let me make sure we're good time-wise. You never know. So you can see there's two apples up here. Look in your Bibles, John 17. This is where we're going to be today. As we go through the Gospel of John, and we've taken some breaks in the Gospel of John as the Lord has led us, some, some divine detours, if you want to call it that. But this morning we're going to be in John 17, verses 18 through 23. And let me, let me explain again, you may not have been with us through the Gospel of John, you may not know what's taking place in John chapter 17, but where we're at, we're in the midst of Jesus' high priestly prayer. He is acting as our high priest. And I thought about it this morning, you know, there, there are times in the scriptures where Jesus teaches us how to pray, which is awesome, and there are times where you actually hear him pray, but not to this extent. Now, we know Jesus was praying. He was constantly a man of prayer, constantly as the Son in connection with the Father. But in chapter 17, this is a prayer. I don't want you to just take it. I know in, in my Bible, and yours may be the same, the words of Jesus are in red. But I don't want us to forget that this is a prayer. This is Him speaking to the Father, but on behalf of someone. And so that's where we're kind of fit into this. So I want you to have that mindset that we are right in the midst of this high priestly prayer. Jesus, and as the high priest would, he would stand in between God and man. And that's what Jesus is doing as he's lifting this prayer up. But something interesting, when, when we were on the mission field, how many years ago was that? Seven? No, nine. This was nine years ago. When we were on the mission field, and our mission when we were in, in Bolivia, it was going through a lot of changes. A lot of things were taking place in the home office, which you know, reverberates onto the fields in which you're at. And one of the discussions among missionaries on our field in particular was a discussion of what, or, or rather who, is a missionary? Now you may think that's kind of a weird discussion because here was the thing. Uh, on our mission field, we had professors, we had teachers, we had dorm monitors for a seminary. We had people who worked with street and homeless ministries. Um, we had people who worked with merely discipleship of churches that were established. That's what we did. And then there were church planners. But a lot of the discussion in the home office was, okay, as we're focused and how we want to be focused in the world, what makes a missionary and, and who is a missionary? Well, i got to be honest with you, that, that talk to me on the mission field, and I think maybe among most missionaries, was kind of a waste of time. Because we were there. Everybody who was there, whether it was a dorm mom or whether it was a teacher or it's speaking to English um, kids, but, but still in a foreign field, it didn't matter. You were on mission. You were serving the Lord. And that's the thing. A lot of times when we talk about missions, we kind of group people in, in two categories. There's the people who go. And does anybody know what the other group is? The people who send. And that's true to some extent, and, and really that's true when you're dealing with foreign missions. You have people that are called to go, and then you have people that support those missionaries, and both of them are equally important. But there's something I want us to understand. You may not ever be called to go abroad. You may not ever be called to go on a mission trip outside of this country. You might not even be called to go on a mission trip somewhere in this country or even in this state. So here's a question. Let's, let's just call you, if that's you, let's just call you a plain old Christian, okay? If that's you, are you any less of a Christian? I want to read to you some verses. This is in preparation. You can turn there to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. For some of you, it's going to be a familiar text of Scripture, but I just want to read this and remind us who we are in Christ. Paul's writing, he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So as Christians, we are all different, but part of one body. But one thing that we all have in common, every believer, 
Every single one of you who are in Christ. And what I mean by that is you've, you've looked to the cross. You have trusted in what Jesus Christ has done on behalf of you for your sin. You've placed your faith in him. You know he died and has been raised from the dead. If that's you, you have been sent. Please understand that. And I think on some extent, you know, we can debate on the term missionary. But every Christian... No matter where you are, you have been sent. Let's get into our text. I'll read this. This will make more sense when we get into the John chapter 17. Look in verse 18. We'll start there and we'll go through verse 23. And again, Jesus in the midst of his prayer says to the Father, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be even as we are, one. I in them, and you in me, and that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me. And love them even as you loved me. Father, please bless your word. Bless it, Lord, as it's been read. And Father, now as we expound upon it, we we expand on what this truly means, Father. I pray for everyone here that you open our ears, that you open our eyes to see clearly, that you prepare our hearts. And Holy Spirit, that you move in a mighty way. You have full sway here. Just blow through this place, blow through our lives Interrupt whatever's going on in this time in our lives. You're worthy of that. And challenge us and change us. Father, as always, the prayers don't leave us the same as we walk out the door as we did when we came in. Change us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's an interesting word, and you can kind of get it from the title. That word sent. That word sent in, in the Greek and I'm no Greek scholar, but time to time I think we get a deep meaning when we, when we kind of touch in on what the Greek of certain words is. That word in the Greek is apostello. Does that, does that sound like any word in scripture that you may hear? Francis, when you apostle. Yeah, that's the root word where we get the name apostle. And really what that means, that, that word sent or apostello, it's, it's a commission. It's a command. It's a duty. Some of you have served in the military. You understand commands. You understand duty. But it's also to be sent on a defined mission by a superior. That's what that word means that that we see in this particular section of scripture. When Jesus says sent, this is what he means. Here's another way I like to look at it. It's an official or an authoritative sending. It's not just some kind of wishy-washy, whimsical thing. Like, oh, today I think I'll go over to to the side of the road and, and just look at the grass. It's, not, it's more deeper than that. It's so purposeful and very direct. And that's what God is giving to us. But look at what Jesus says in verse 18. He says, as you, now you've got to remember who he's praying to. That you is the Father. So he's saying, as you, Father, sent me. Now plug in that definition of the word sent. That, that commission, that duty. That authoritative sending. As you did that to me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So as the Father has sent the Son. I don't want to just pass over that. I want to hit through some scriptures and you can turn there quick. They're all in the Gospel of John. All of them are going to be familiar to you. But I want us to be reminded of what it means by Jesus saying, I have been sent by the Father. John 1.14 This is a familiar verse. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now you may say, wait a minute, the word sent isn't there. No, it's embedded in there. Because the Word becoming flesh, He was sent by the Father to come and to tabernacle with us, to live with us, to robe Himself in the frailty of humanity, and to live. But at the same time, being 100% human, being 100% God. That's what our Jesus Christ, that's what our Lord and Savior did. He dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So there Jesus is sent. Now jump ahead to John chapter 7 verse 28. 
John 7, 28, Jesus speaking, he says, you know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true and him you do not know. I know him for I come from him and he sent me. Now jump just in my Bible, it's just one page over to verse 38 of chapter 6. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And now one more verse, and we're going to jump ahead of where we are, chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus speaking, he says, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So when we look at those verses, when we see those four verses, we see first off that he became flesh and he lived among men. He's in the world. He was sent into the world. He was sent from the Father. He was sent to do not his will, but the Father's will. And just as the Father sent him, Jesus is sending us. So that's where we have to get our minds wrapped around. That as Christians, we are sent as the Father. And in this manner, Jesus says it in John chapter 17 that we're reading, verse 18. As you sent me, Father, as as Jesus was sent by the Father, he says, so I have sent them. So in all those ways that I just described as Jesus is sent, he's sent among men. We are sent among men in the world. Just as he was sent from the Father, who sends us? It's the Father sends us just as he sent Jesus. Why are we sent by the Father? To do his will. Not our will. His will. And of course, it's Jesus Christ as well, because he and the Father are one, that sends us out into this world. This world, for Christians, it's not about just escaping this world. Y'all want to do that sometimes? (laughs) Three of us do. All right. You know, there are so many things that are going wrong in this world that sometimes you just want out. And I'm not talking about anything awful. What I mean is you just want to go home. You just want to be with the Lord because you know that that's where your home is. But we are not, when we become Christians, we just don't zap right out of here. We've talked about this before. Let me remind us what's going on, why we are kept here in the world. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Apostle Paul says, For we are his, speaking of God's, speaking of the Father, we are his workmanship. That idea of workmanship is a product. It's something that has been created. It is a creation. And then he goes on, we are God's workmanship, or we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Remember what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5.17. We are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Christian, there are good works for all of us to do. And please understand this, and and I, I hope you understand this. These works aren't gaining you any favor with God. You're not earning your way to heaven by doing good works. It doesn't work like that. The work's already been done. It's Jesus Christ. He's laid down his life for us. On that cross, and we talked about this in VBS, and it was, I think it was very vivid for the kids. There's a transfer that takes place when we look to the cross. And the trade off is profound. We transfer our sins upon the head of Jesus Christ. What does He give us in return? His perfection, His righteousness. What a trade off. That's not an equal trade. Thank God it's not an equal trade. We give him our sinfulness, he gives us his righteousness. We give him our dirty rags, he gives us new, fresh garments that aren't going to be stained. And I'm not talking about, I'm not saying you're not going to sin. But what I mean is the righteousness of Christ is upon you. Therefore, that sin will not stain you, will not last. It can't. And so we look at this idea that we are sent out to do the Father's will because there are good works, there are good deeds that he's prepared beforehand. It amazes me to think on that. You know, we kind of live our lives and, and, and we should as Christians every day, we should read our Bibles and we should ask the Lord, what do you have in store for me? Let me follow you today because that's really what it means to be a Christian. It doesn't just mean to come to faith at a point in your past. That's important. You want to do that. You want to trust him. But it is an everyday following of Jesus Christ. Every day. Christian, we should never take a day off from following Jesus. Because if he took a day off from holding us, where would we be? We'd be lost. 
But thank God he says that he holds us in the palm of his hand. And no one can pluck us from his hand. No one. And so this idea here, we are following him every day. And he's got these things that we sort of stumble in. But there's no stumbling or, or happenstance or, or just sort of a quinky dink with God. It's purposeful. He's got these things planned out for us. And so we're sent. Now, where are we sent? Look at what Jesus said. Verse 18. It makes it very clear where he was sent and where he's sending us. He says, as you sent me where? Into the world. I have sent them into the world. This world, this world, I mean, we look around. We, we, we see the news. We know what's going on. We heard the prayer requests for, for places like Russia and North Korea. We understand persecution, all of these things. The world's a decaying place. The world is a place that is being trashed and has been trashed by sin, and it's not getting any better. But that's the world that we've been sent into. Remember the words of Jesus. He says it in chapter 5 of Matthew. He says, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. Now think about that. Think about being the salt. Anybody here like salt? (laughs) Yeah, we all kind of laugh. Some like it too much. (laughs) But when you don't add too much to it, what does it do? It flavors It enhances what it is that you're eating. But it does more than that. Anybody here ever ever have a ham? Anybody here ever have a ham that they had? They had the... What was that? Yeah, you got to salt them. And then before you eat them, you better get all that salt on them. Why do you do that? Why do you do that? Why do you cure a ham? Preserves it. Otherwise it would decay. It would rot. So you think about that now in light of who we are, that Jesus says, Christian, you are the salt of the earth. You bring a certain flavor to the earth that the world doesn't know in and of itself. It's a pure flavor. It's a beautiful thing to bring the flavor of God into a world that needs it desperately. But also, we as Christians are here to keep this world from decaying. We've gone through a study in Revelation that we're about to wrap up. What happens when the church is taken out? Things don't get better. You're down the tubes in a hurry. Where's the church? The church has been raptured up. And so the world goes on a fast track, even faster than it is now, of decay. We are the salt of the earth. But we're also the light of the world. Think on this. What does light do? It shines. It shines in darkness. Now, I don't know about you. I've been in some pretty dark places. You guys ever been to, like, the Seneca Caverns or Smoke Hole? You guys ever been there? I hate what they do when you get in the deepest part of those caves. I hate it. You know what they do? They shut the lights off. I hate that. So what I do is I close my eyes before and I trick them and then I open them and the lights are back on. And it's, I'm not afraid of the dark. It just, I just don't like it. Maybe I'm a little rebellious. But here's one thing I do know. You can go to the darkest place of any cave and you may not even be able to see the hand in front of your face. But when you turn on the smallest of lights, what happens? That darkness retreats. I've never been in a place where darkness was so thick and so deep that it drowned out light. Doesn't happen. So think on this. You are light. Christian, you are light in this dark world that is so dark that it thinks it can snuff you out. It thought it could snuff out the Son of God on the cross. Three days later, it found out just how glorious and how much light He truly is. So that's how we're to live our lives as we go out in this world. We are called, we are sent into the world. And then Jesus goes on, verse 19, he says, For their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. That's pretty much the same word, that idea of of sanctification or, or consecration. It's the idea of holiness. It's being set apart, it's being separated. I like this definition of it. It is to separate from things profane, And dedicate to God. I don't know about you. That's my testimony. That's my testimony of who I was before Christ. Profane. Nasty. Dirty. Filthy. A God hater. And then that collision course that I like to say I have with Jesus Christ. Where he invaded my life. Convicted me. And I handed my life over to him. Crying out for forgiveness. Then I became someone who was dedicated to God. That's what Jesus is saying about himself. Even though he had no sin, he was dedicated to God. He wasn't here to do his own will. He says, for their sake, I consecrate myself. Why? That they also may be consecrated. That you and I may be sanctified in truth. Set apart. 
Now, again, I want to be very clear on this. We had this, this come up at Vacation Bible School. There was a young man who said that he wanted to receive Christ, but he was kind of afraid because he knew he was going to sin again. And I said, well, here's the thing. When we come to faith in Christ, we don't become perfect. We don't become sinless. We still have that sin nature, but the Spirit of God lives inside of us. And greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And that death on the cross dealt with all of those sins in the past, the present, and the future in that one time. So Jesus doesn't have to be re-crucified. He died once for all, and he is able to save to the uttermost. So we see this, this idea here of he is sanctified as we should live a life that's sanctified. And then he says in verse 20, well, before that, you may be thinking and, and you wouldn't be wrong to think, wait a minute, at this point, if you, if you understand context, right now he's been praying for the apostles. He's been praying for those disciples who gave up their careers as fishermen and other things and followed behind him. And remember that imagery of a disciple. And if you're in Christ, you're a disciple. And it's that idea of having the dust of the one you're following kick up on you. You're following that close. And so at this point, you may be thinking, wait a minute, he's just talking to them. Well, guess what? Verse 20 is an exciting verse. Listen to this. This is Jesus praying his high priestly prayer to the Father. And listen to what he says. I do not ask for these only. Now, these only, he's talking about the apostles. He's talking about those disciples who at this point had just finished the Last Supper, and they were about to move across the Kidron Valley and go up to the Garden of Gethsemane where he would be arrested. That's who he's talking about. That's who these only are. But he says, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, I'm, I may get in trouble for this. I about got in trouble last week. You guys remember what I said last week when I was talking about a four and a half foot wall? And I asked, you know, you all remember, and I asked my wife to stand up. Now, let me make this very clear. Some of you may have misinterpreted what I meant by that. I did not, was not talking with. I was talking height. He is alive. I am alive, yes. <laughs> Therefore, you understand, I was not saying she's four and a half feet wide. She's, how tall are you? You're not even four and a half feet tall. How tall are you? Five, two. Okay, five, two. Anyway, I was picking on her. Now, now it's your turn. I'm pretty sure none of you were there when Jesus was alive. I'm pretty sure. Anybody there when Jesus was alive? No. You weren't there when Jesus was alive and walked on the earth. I'm, I'm making fun of you. You guys can laugh. You can laugh a little bit. That's a joke. Now, if you weren't there when Jesus was alive, then you're not one of these only. Then therefore you are one of those, it says, that will believe in him through their word. Every single one of us here in this sanctuary who hears this message is prayed for by Jesus in these words. I do not ask for these only. I'm not just praying for the apostles, but also for those, for me, for you, who will believe. We have believed in Jesus Christ, not because we lived with him, not because we watched him, not because we saw him with our own eyes crucified and raised from the dead, but we believe it as though we were, but we believe through the apostles' testimony, through the scriptures that they wrote, through their word. That's us. I don't know about you. That excites me to think that right here, Jesus is praying for me. He's praying for you. It's how much he loves us. That's how much he looked forward to the time when we would be brought into that fold and we would hear the voice of our shepherd and let him lead. I don't ask for those only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one. That we would be one, in a sense, with those apostles, but also one another. That we would be one. This idea, and you brought it out, community. That's what we strive to be here as a community of believers. I didn't mention it, but we're, we're pushing hard this month of August to, to really invite you to Sunday school if you haven't been to Sunday school. And, and all I'm asking is there's, there's four Sundays in the month of August. All I'm asking is for four hours of your month to come. And to be a part of Sunday school. And here's not why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this for numbers. We're, we're not a church that can base anything off of numbers, quite frankly. But today we had a big Sunday school. But what happens in Sunday school is fellowship. 
What happens in Sunday school is real community of believers who share, who love, who laugh, who cry. That's what happens in that Sunday school. And those who are a part of it, they want you to be a part of it too. We all are one in Christ. We want to be one as believers who God has called to Canaan Valley Baptist Church. This is a community of believers. So we want to strive to be that in this house and outside of this house in the world. Jesus is saying that they all may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us, Christian. You are in the Father and the Son. You have the Spirit of God inside of you. Those Christians in North Korea, those Christians in Russia, they are also in the Father, in the Son, in the Holy Spirit. We are one with them as well because there was one blood that was shed on the cross for all of us. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is saying that we would all be one. They also may be in us so that the world, why? What's the point of this unity or even this idea of community? To be one in them To be one together so that the world may believe that God sent Jesus Christ. So that the world would see Jesus Christ in us. He called us the light of the world, but where's that source of light? It's Him. It's Him. And so when we're in a dark world, we want them to see not us, but Him. We want it to reflect straight off of us and right up to Him. So that they might come to faith in God through Jesus Christ. And become part of this. Become one with us as they are one with the Father and the Son. As the Spirit lives inside of them. He says in verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one even as we are one. There's that idea again of unity. And that idea of glory. That manifestation of all that God is. Of all he is. Being known to us and making it known in the world. He says, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Why? So that the world may know that you sent me. He says it again. And love them. And this is so powerful. Love them as you loved me. Now think on that. And some, some Sundays for me, some Sunday mornings can just be real busy. Real, real busy. You know, I'm running all over the place. I'm running up to the resort. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And and today I'm driving back from the resort and it just just hit me. I want to be overwhelmed by the love of God through Jesus Christ because he loves me and he loves you. Think about how much he loves you. He says, and this is his prayer, and you can know this, when Jesus is praying, his prayers are being heard. His prayers are being answered. He says, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. As much as the Father loves the Son, Christian, that's how much God loves you. You can never ever say, I don't feel love today. Maybe you don't feel it, but it's not about feelings. It's about fact. It's about truth. And so when you hear that little voice in your head or or you hear that whisper that you are unlovable, you can say, wait a minute, no. I'm in Christ, and I am as loved by the Father as much as he loves his own son. That's how much he loves you. Let that love wash over you. Let it be so real in your life. Let it be such a tangible thing. Don't just let it be something that you believe and and just kind of put to the side. Let it be something that that motivates you, that moves you, that that challenges you, that humbles you, that brings you to excitement and joy, but also even to, to tears. That's how powerful the love of God is that he has for you and for me. So this is the love. This is the love that he loves us with, that we in return love him with and love one another with. So here's our mission, Christian. This is your mission. And it's in the world. And it's not just to escape it, all right? It's not just to, to look at it and, and, and see it and, and just be, be repelled by it. Sometimes I can be like that. Sometimes I see stuff in the world, I'm just like, ah! And God reminds me, no, you pray for that person. You love that person. Because here's the reality. That was us. Every single one of us. That was us before we came to faith in Christ. So our mission is we are sent into the world, but we are sent to be in it, 
but not of it. We're set apart from it, but we're in this world to make God known. By the grace of God, we're no longer a part of that world, but we make it known, make Him known to a lost and dying world, to people who desperately need to know Him. How do we do it? We do it through word. We do it through the gospel as we proclaim it out. We proclaim out the truth that, yes, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We don't judge people. We're not looking down on them for that. We're sinners. And that Jesus Christ wasn't. And He traded places with us on the cross and dealt with our sin in full. And took it to the grave and was raised from the dead. You know what I just did? In 15 seconds, I shared the gospel. It didn't take long. 15 seconds, we share truth that can not just be life-changing, but eternity-changing with people. So on this mission, on this, this fact that we're sent, we share it through word, through the gospel. We share it through our testimony. Nobody can refute your testimony in Christ. It's your experience. It's what God did in your life. Share it. Share it openly. Share it unashamedly because it is truth and it's the reality of what God can do in their life as well. But not only through word, but we, we need to make him known through deed. We've got those works, those works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. Let's walk and follow Jesus and walk in them. That's what we're called to do. That's what we're sent to do. Share something just in closing about eternal life. Eternal life will cost you nothing. Because it's been done, it's been dealt with, it's been purchased, you've been ransomed. All of that has been taken place on the cross by Jesus Christ. Eternal life costs you nothing. But following Jesus will cost you everything. You may think, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like such a good deal. You know what he'll do? He'll take your dreams that you have without him, and he'll change them. And he'll give you new dreams. He'll take your desires that you have without him and he'll give you new desires in your heart. He'll take your heart that you think is so full of life and he'll pull it out because it's a heart of stone to him and he'll put a heart of flesh in your life. He'll change the core of who you are that it lives and that it beats and that it longs to know him, to love him and to make him known. That's what it means to follow Jesus every day. For some, it even costs them their very life. Whatever it costs you, whatever it costs me to follow Jesus in the end, when we look into the eyes of our Savior, we will say profoundly and boldly, it was absolutely worth it. Anything we lose for the sake of Christ is absolutely worth it in the end. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are our loving Father. You have sent us, as you sent your Son into the world, you have sent us, your children in Christ, into the world. It's a dark place, but you're with us. Jesus, you made it very clear you were not leaving those disciples as orphans. We have not been left as orphans. We have the Spirit of God living inside of us. Give us the mind of Christ. We have it. Give it. More of it so that we can know how you want us to walk and where we need to be and how we want to find these works that you have prepared in advance for us. Help us to follow you, Jesus, every day. And Lord, I pray that if there are people here today who, who don't know you, who are not following you, who have not trusted you, who maybe for the first time are hearing about the cross, Jesus, make it so real in their lives, the fact that that you've died for their sins. You have taken care of it. And all we have to do is believe, trust, reach out in faith and take hold of that grace that you're extending to us. We don't deserve it, but you give it freely. You want us to be restored to you. We praise you for that. So Father, we commit all of this to you. We thank you again for your love. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.